The following fair use documentary is rated X for Exertus and contains profane and gratuitous historical authenticity that might not be acceptable for some viewers. Audience discretion is advised. Exertus. <laughs> Though there are many stories that somehow remain, and I intend to tell the story of John Wilmot, but before we get to the Earl of Rochester II, let's go back to Starfish and tell the story of the little old lady on the beach. So once upon a time, there was a little old lady, and she was walking upon a very old beach. And upon that beach, there were a number of starfish that had been tossed to the shore by the waves. And in the foam, the starfish were finding themselves unable to crawl back into the sea, and they were drying out. Thousands, thousands of starfish tossed upon the shore, unable to reach back into the jetty. So then there came across in the dawn, walking at low tide, this little old tiny lady, and she was grabbing the starfish and she was throwing them, each one by one, back into the sea. Throwing dozens perhaps, but of course there would only be dozens compared to the thousands which had laid across the beach, dying. So then upon the beach there was a little old man, he saw the little old lady with the little starfish. And the little old man shook up his little old hand at the little old lady and he yelled his little old voice. And he let out a little laugh. And he said with a little bit of sarcasm but a little bit of a smile. Don't you see how many starfish there are? You think throwing back a few of the starfish is going to help them? You think what you're doing matters? You think you're helping? So then the little old lady grabs another starfish and throws it back into the sea. And then the little old lady says... It matters to each one of the starfish that I do throw back into the sea. It helps a little. So that's my story about the little old lady and the starfish. Anyway, on to John Wilmot. Died at 33, born April 1st, April Fools, 1647, in Ditchley, Oxfordshire, England. Died 1680, July 26th, in Woodstock. Here's a picture of John next to his monkey. And that's just what kind of a guy John Wilmot was. In fact, he was a little nuts because he had syphilis, but in general, society itself was completely insane. He had been born in 1647 and watched the Great Fire of London in 1666. As a teenager, he had seen the gnarliest of society go down. And after the burning of London, the puritanical society shifted into one of Sodom and Gomorrah. This was a time when men wore long hair and listened to crazy music and took all sorts of crazy substances. Where drugs and debauchery and rhyme were king, and the god of hellfire reigned, Cupid's crossbow was set to automatic. I'm the king of the summer solstice. And I'm the living queen. Our message is this, that this is the beginning of summer solstice, and we're all here today to groove and have a beautiful time together, and that it's only the beginning. June 21st marks the beginning, and it will continue as long as people can get together and love each other and share things together and listen to music and have a beautiful time. Gin was cheaper than water. Venereal diseases spread like ideologies. Books were used as rolling paper. And, well, you get the idea. It was the most liberal period in recent history, and don't you forget it. Any misconceptions you have about the 1960s are sheer naive fantasy. When rap stars sing about, well, anything depravity sorrow profanity it's all gratuitous none of it none of it's useful or new eminem's new album is not fire the fire of london 66 is fire this is fire and if you want to see some crazy things and understand exactly how deep and dark the rabbit hole really goes look no further than 1666 because nothing that we have done is anything new under the sun there has already long been love on hate street in the stories of sodom and great britain or the period of Syphilis Maximus, and the general outbreaking of certain kinds of plagues which followed, were certainly a response to both the liberties, which themselves were a response to the puritanical society which had followed. And I do not mean to say that there are not lessons to be learned from this existential endeavor, but do learn them. 
because they were expensive lessons to learn, and there's utterly no reason for Billie Eilish to be repeating these lessons. And if there is one such thing that we should have learned from John Wilmot, tis is no such thing as free love, milady. But just in case there's anything to glean, I'm going to read you some John Wilmot, and I already apologize. Much wine had passed with grave discourse of who fucks who and who does horse, such as you usually do hear from those that died at the beer. When I who still take care to see drunkenness relieved by lechery, went out into St. James's Park to cool my head and fire my heart. I know St. James's has the honor on it, Tis consecrate a prick and cunt. There, by most incestuous birth, strange wood springs from the teeming earth, for they relate how heretofore an ancient pick began to whore. Deluded of his assignation, jilting it seems was then in fashion, poor pensive lover in this place would frig upon his mother's face. When rows of mandrakes tall did rise, whose lewd tops fucked the very skies, each imitating branch does twine in some loved fold of aretine. And nightly now beneath their shade are buggeries, rapes, and incest made. Unto this all sin sheltering grove, whores of the bulk and the alcove, great ladies, chambermaids, and drudges, the rag picker and the harris trudges, Carmen, divine. Great lords and tailors, apprentices, poets, pimps, and jailers. Footmen, fine fops, do here arrive, and here promiscuity they swipe. Along these hallowed walks it was that I beheld Corinna past, who ever had been by to see the proud disdain she cast on me through charming eyes. We would have swore she dropped from the heaven that very hour, forsaking the divine abode in scorn of some despairing god. But mark what creatures women are, how infinitely vile when fair. Three nights of the elbow and the slur, with wriggling tails made up to her. The first was your white hole balls, the neck in the mother of the maids graced by whose favor he was able to bring a friend to the waiter's table, where he had heard Sir Edward Sutton say how the king loved Banstead mutton, since when he'd never be brought to eat by goods will any other meat. In this as well as all the rest, he ventures to do like the best, but wanting common sense, the ingredient in choosing well, not last expedient, converts abortive imitation to universal affectation. Thus he does not eat and talks, but feels and smells it down and walks, nay looks and lives and loves by rote and old tawdry birthday coat. The second was a grace within wit. The second was a Gray's Inwit, a great inhabitor of the pit, a critic like he sits and squints, steals pocket handkerchiefs and hints from his neighbor and the comedy to court and pay his landlady. The third, a lady's eldest son is within a few years of twenty-one who hopes from his propitious fate against he comes to his estate. By these two worthies to be made a most accomplished tearing blade. One in the strain twixt tune and nonsense cries, Madam, I have loved you long since, permit me your fair hand to kiss. And at her mouth a cunt cries, Yes, in short, without much more ado, joyful and pleased away she flew. And with these three confounded asses, from park to hackney coach she passes. So a proud bitch does not lead a bout of humble curse the armorer's rout, who must obsequiously do hunt the savory scent of salt swan cunt. Some powers more patient now relate the sense of his surprising fate. Gods, 
that a thing admired by me should fall in such infamy. Had she picked out to rub her ass on some stiff pricked clown or well hung parson, each job of whose spermatic sluice had filled a cunt with wholesome juice, I the proceeding should have phrased, in hope she had quenched a fire I raced. Such natural freedoms are but just, there's something generous in mere lust. But to turn a damned, abandoned jade, when neither head nor tail persuade, to be a whore in understanding, a passive pot for fools to spend in, the devil play booty sure would be to bring a blot of infamy. But why am I of all mankind to so severe a fate design, ungrateful? Why this treachery to humble fond believing me, who gave you privileged above the nice allowances of love? Did I ever refuse to bear the meanest part of your lusts could spare? Fuck. Did I ever refuse to bear the meanest part your lust could spare? When your lewd cunt came spewing home, drenched with the seed of half the town, my dram of sperm was supped up after, for the digestive surfeit water, full gorged at another time, with a vast meal of slime, which your devouring cunt had drawn from porters, bracks, and footmen's brawn. I was content to serve you up, my bollock full for your grace cup, nor ever thought it was an abuse, while you had pleasure for excuse. You that could make my heart away, for noise and colour, and betray the secrets of my tender hours to such night-errant paramours, when, leaning on your faithless breast, wrapped in security and rest, soft kindness, all my powers did move, and reason lay dissolved in love. May stinking vapours choke your wound, such as the men you dote upon, may your depraved appetite that could in whiffling fool's delight beget such frenzies in your mind. You may go mad for the north wind, all fixing all your hopes upon it to have him bluster in your cunt, turn up your longing ass to the air and perish in a wild despair. But cowards shall forget to rhyme, schoolboys to frig, old whores to paint, the Jesuits' fraternity shall leave the use of buggery. Crab louse, inspired with grace divine, from earthly cod to heaven shall climb. Physician shall believe in Jesus, and disobedient cease to please us. Ere I desist with all my power to plague this woman and undo her, but my revenge will best be timed when she is married, that is lined. In that most lamentable state, I'll make her feel my scorn and hate, pelt her with scandals, truth and lies, and her poor cur with jealous eye, till I have torn him from her breach. While she whines like a dog-drawn bitch, lone and despised, kicked out of the town, into some dirty hole alone, to chew the cud of misery. And no, she owes it all to me. And may no women better thrive, that there is profane the cunt I swipe. There you go. John Wilmot. So you see, in a sort of way, John Wilmot was a sort of satyr against mankind. Those are his words, not mine. Both the poem as well as a satyr against mankind. Actually, his thesis, a rather Hobbesian response to puritanical values as well as liberty. There is an interesting movie about John Wilmot starring Johnny Depp called The Libertine. More or less brutal than just reading his words, you decide. Blinded and diseased, with syphilis and his nose falling off of his face. Before his 33rd birthday, as a personal favor to the King Charles of England at the time, a sort of feuding friend for this proto-punk rock degenerate, unannounced to the court, John Wilmot, who had been in hiding at the time after 
producing a play about dildos and buggery for the King of England, who was hoping to be remembered as a champion of liberty and theater, but instead was remembered as the man who allowed liberty to burn down London and to allow an entire society to become obsessed with masturbatory rudimentrics to the point of personal self-destruction, as well as that of the entire society. And there were those who idolized his liberty and looked at John Wilmot as the libertine. So when he arrived into the court to protect the king, a king who some of the parliament who had intended to remove not because of his dedication to liberty, but because of his familial relationship to some Catholics, John Wilmot argued that if there was ever an expert before on the experience of liberty, he himself had become or usurped that expert. And he proposed that it was the king's privilege which made it possible for liberty to thrive to such extreme proportions. Because of this, he was able to single-handedly spin the parliament in favor of protecting the king. Most of our legal system today comes not from the Greco-Roman or Arawak, but from the disputes of these syphilis-enriched men after the fire in 1666 and their dedication to their own literal self-degeneracy, but yet also their fear of the Catholics. Seder Against Reason and Mankind address the questions of the proper use of reason and is generally assumed to be Wilmot's Sobesian critique of rationalism. Wilmot subordinates reason to sense and is based to some extent on Bilal's version of Juvenal's 8th or 15th satire and is also indebted to Hobbes, Montaigne, Lucretius, and Epicurus, as well as the general libertine tradition. Confusion has arisen in its interpretation as it's ambiguous as to whether the speaker is Rochester himself or a satirized persona. It criticizes the vanities and corruptions of the statesmen and the politicians of the court of Charles II. The king who more or less loved this guy. I mean, in general, in general up to the point where John Wilmot was purposefully trying to embarrass him. King Charles friggin' loved this guy. But you know, syphilis maximus and punk rock. Took a charter flight on a DC-10 to London, landed at Heathrow, took a cab to the city center. Don't let people lie to you, hostels are for the ugly. I'm staying in home house in the most beautiful hotel in the world. Called a friend from school who was selling hash, but she wasn't in. Met a couple of Brits who take me to, of all places, Camden Street. I flirted a bit at the Virgin Megastore, buy some CDs, then followed some girls with pink hair. I wandered around trying to get laid until it started to rain, then went back to home house. Ministry of Sound is dead, so I go to REM form, but it's gay night. I find the one-headed girl in the place and we dry hump on the dance floor. We cab it back to home house. I strip her clothes off, suck her toes, and we fuck. I hung out for four or five days, met the world's biggest DJ, Paul. All open fold, kept missing the changing of the guards. Wrote my mom a postcard I never sent. Bought some speed from an Italian junkie who was trying to sell me a stolen bike. Smoked a lot of hash that had too much tobacco in it. Saw the Tate, saw Big Ben, ate a lot of weird English food. It rained a lot, it was expensive, and I'm jonesing, so I split for Amsterdam. The Dutch all know English, so I didn't have to speak any Dutch, which was a relief. I cruised the red light district, visit a sex show, visit a sex museum, smoke a lot of hash. I meet a Dutch TV actress and we drank absinthe at a bar called Absinthe. The museums were cool, I guess. Lots of Van Goghs and the Vermeers were intense. Wandered around, bought a lot of pastries, ate some intense waffles. We bought some coke and I cruised the red light district until I found some blonde with big tits that reminds me of Lara. I gave her a hundred guilders. In the end, she pulled me out and I come between her tits even though I'm wearing a rubber. Afterward, we made small talk about AIDS, her Moroccan pimp and herself. I wake to the sound of a wino singing. It's 8 a.m. and hot as blazes. I pretend to ice skate around Central Station while someone plays the sax. Trade songs with a Kiwi girl that split for Paris by train. One of the Sean's Lise climbed the Eiffel Tower for only seven francs because the ticket machine was broken. Got the hang of the metro, took it everywhere, went to a Ford model party and hooked up with a Romanian model named Karina. She tugs my cock at the Marriott Sean's Lise, which is good. We played billiards, went shopping. I think she gave me mono. Little Ferrari that belonged to a member of the Saudi royal family. Made out with a Dutch model in front of the Louvre. Saw the Arc de Triomphe and almost became roadkill crossing the street. Oki invites me to Dublin so I catch an Aer Lingus flight and stay at the Morrison. Dublin rocks like you can't imagine. Oki pulled us, we spit some discs with them. Irish girls are a small slapper knot. I swap pickies with a drunk one and after groping my ass and calling me Mr. LA, she strips from me in the bathroom of the club. Sneak into the Guinness factory and steal some stout so good my dick goes hard. I fly to Barcelona, which is a low rent bus. Too many fat American students, too many lame meat markets. I dropped acid at the Sprout of Leo, which was a trip to say the least. Cruise up the coast to the Museo Galadali, but had no more acid, which sucked. Some girl from Canada calls me on my cell, so I let her listen to the church bells and catechists. Captain Cruz is beautiful, but there are no girls there, just old hippies, so I went to Switzerland, where I ironically couldn't find anyone at the time. Took the Glacier Express up the Schiltorn, which is beautiful in a way I can't describe. We were passed into Italy and ended up in Venice, where I met a hot girl who looks like Rachel Lee Cook and speaks better English than I do. She's living for a year on only $5 a day. We got a little round, buy some mass. She thinks I'm a capitalist because my hotel room costs more than one night than she's spending her entire trip, but she doesn't mind it so much when I pay the bills. I ditch her and hook up with a couple of 
Fox Theater 1 and 3, so too much tension there, but the doofus officer drives me to Rome and offer I jump back. Traffic is bad and we're stopped for hours without moving. The wife turns out to be a freak. The guy starts to wig out on me. It's like a Polanski film. We stop for a while in Florence where I see some big dome. A bomb goes off and I lose the weird couple, which is probably for the best. Ended up in Rome, which is big and hot and dirty. It was just like LA, but with ruins. I went to the Vatican, which was ridiculously opulent. Stood for two hours to get in the Sistine Chapel, which now that it's been cleaned, looks fake. I meet two underage Italian girls who I try to talk into fucking each other while I jack off onto them. Bored, I buy them some ice cream instead. My hotel is a gym, so I work out. I bump into some guy from Camden who says he knows me, but I'm sure that he's a fag, so I lose him. I try to fart and instead shit my pants. Back in my hotel room, I masturbate and have a pain in my groin. That night, I dream about a beautiful girl half in water stretching her lean body. She asks me if I like it, and I tell her she can clean fish with it. I don't know what it means, but I wake well rested, masturbate in the shower, and check out. I make my way back to London and hang out in Piccadilly Circus. Hmm. Palacon. I swap shirts with some upper crusty Cambridge chick. Hers was an Agnes B, mine a Costume National. She acts stuffy and prudish, but is really wild underneath it all. She barely looks at my abs, though she wants to. The next day I drop some acid and get lost in the subway for a full day and can't find my way out. I meet a cute girl as we jack off onto her as long as no cum gets onto her Paul Smith coat. We get stoned while listening to Michael Jackson records and the next morning I wake up talking to myself. I have a big bump on my head from flailing in my sleep. I get my stuff and barely make my plane back to the United States. I no longer know who I am, and I feel like the ghost of a total stranger. Sixteen forty, King Charles the First of England and Scotland has recalled Parliament. Why? Because his Scottish subjects were rebelling against his religious reforms, and he needed men and money to fight them. He was hoping that Parliament would forget the previous seven years, in which he'd governed without them and simply give them the money. But he was wrong. Instead. Parliament wanted to right all of Charles' previous wrongs against them. So he dissolved the Parliament after only three weeks. And this is why we call it the Short Parliament. The rebelling Scots were called Covenanters. And the Scottish Covenanters soon after crossed the English border and occupied these lands. Thomas Wentworth, King Charles' close ally, was to lead the English resistance, but instead, the army opted for a different strategy, running away. Because of this, Charles was forced to cave in to most of the Scots' demands, and he ended up paying the Scot Covenanters to leave the north lands of England that they had seized. And of course, King Charles would need more money to pay them, so he went to Parliament for this as well. So once more, King Charles was forced to recall Parliament. He did so, hoping yet again they would simply give him the money, but instead, again, Parliament passed an act that Charles did not like. But given his weak position, Charles was unable to do anything about it. This opposition to Charles was led by a man named John Pym, a Puritan, the rights of Parliament against the monarchy. Parliament had passed the Triennial Act, which meant that Parliament had to be called at least once every three years and that this specific parliament had to give its consent to be dissolved. There was also the new Habeas Corpus Act, meaning where's the body, a bill that meant that the king could not arrest anyone for no reason just so long as it pleased them anymore, but required some sort of actual crime, which had been pre-registered and understood through social contract. Furthermore, William Lord, the Archbishop of Canterbury, was arrested in parliament. And Parliament also had Thomas Wentworth executed for his previous conduct in Ireland. Seeing that King Charles I was making these concessions to the English and Scottish, many Irish were hoping for the same. Some Irish nobles, led by Philem O'Neill, seized forts and demanded the Irish be afforded similar concessions. The Irish populace rose up shortly afterwards, but they were less interested in concessions and more interested in kicking the planted English Protestants out of Ireland. Meanwhile, back in England, English Parliament was still arguing over exactly how awful King Charles was, and in late 1641, by a very slim margin, British Parliament passed something called the Grand Remonstrance. And this was basically a list of reasons why King Charles was terrible, and the perhaps paranoid theory that the previous church reforms of Lord and the Irish Rebellion were part of a Catholic plot. Imagine that. By 1642, Charles had had enough of the people opposing him and decided to put an end to it 
he gathered some soldiers and marched into Parliament with the intent of arresting five of its members, the most notable being John Pym. These members had fled before Charles had arrived, and he left Parliament empty-handed. While he failed to arrest those who had opposed him, he did manage to do one thing. He convinced everyone that he was a tyrant, and as a result, Parliament created the Committee of Safety, which promptly took control of London, as well as London's militia. But Charles freaked out, and King Charles was forced to quickly flee. Both sides started to call its allies, and made preparations for conflict, such as, for instance, when King Charles attempted to seize whole net armory. But of course, they politely yet firmly told King Charles to jog on as the vernacular of the time would fit to verbal fashion. Parliament declared that Charles was a papist, a lover of the Pope, and secretly allied to the Vatican, to the Jesuits, and everything else. Members of Parliament suggested all sorts of outlandish theories, that this libertarian monarch was manipulating the tools of democracy and individual freedom in order to allow the English people to engineer themselves into slavery with the help of the Irish rebels and the discreet as well as boisterous supporters of the Jesuit. Charles warned the aristocracy that Parliament would come for them next if the radicals had their way during this witch hunt. Eventually, on the 22nd of August, 1642, Charles raised his standard over the town of Nottingham. This is considered to be by many the formal beginning of the English Civil War. This pitted Charles' royalist forces, known as Cavaliers, against those of Parliament, known as the Roundheads. As a general rule, the Parliament had the support of the South of England and the East. King Charles had the rest. Parliament had much greater access to money from the largest cities in the South, and it also controlled the Navy, and with it trade. The king had some support in Ireland, with the help of the Scottish royalists, and had access to much better commanders, the most notable being Prince Rupert of the Rhine, Charles' nephew from Bohemia. Charles assembled his forces and made straight for London, where he was met by the parliamentary army, led by Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex, at the Battle of Edgehill. It was essentially a tie, and there was no clear winner. And after some time of pontification, Charles had to decide what to do next before resuming his march on London. By this point, the Earl of Essex had blocked the road, and King Charles retreated, meaning this was not going to be a short war. Throughout 1643, the Royalist Cavalier forces gained the upper hand. The Parliamentarian Roundheads did manage to procure the help of the Scottish Covenanteer Army, though by promising them lots of cash. The Scottish also wanted assurances that the Church of England would be modeled after the Church of Scotland. Naturally, Parliament was never going to agree to this, and so the Roundhead leaders hatched a clever plan. They lied. The Covenanters were vital to the Parliamenters' cause, and proved their worth in 1644 at the Battle of Marston Moor. It was here that the Royalist army of Covenanteers were devastated, particularly by the Roundhead Parliamentarian cavalry, led by a certain Oliver Cromwell. After this defeat, the Royalists basically lost the entire North, and York fell shortly afterwards, despite their success, so ordered that far-reaching reforms be implemented which led to the creation of the professional, well-equipped New Model Army. It's important to note here that not all of the country was happy to be involved in the British Civil War, and many lords and local leaders wanted nothing to do with this, and so assembled their own soldiers known as club men to dissuade either side from coming anywhere near them. 1645 saw the decisive Battle of Naseby, which was yet again followed by a crushing defeat for the Royalists, and was followed up by many more over the next year. Charles knew that the war was lost, and handed himself over to a Scottish force in 1646, practically ending the Civil War. Parliament negotiated with the Scottish to hand over Charles, which they did in 1647, 
Now that Parliament had Charles, their goal was to enact the changes that they had so desired. But this was virtually impossible. The issue being that Charles was completely untrustworthy and would always take the first opportunity to undo the concessions he'd made. Furthermore, much of England was getting riotous due to the tax burden for funding the army. Parliament tried to disband the army, but the army, led by Sir Thomas Fairfax, said no, which was hard to argue with because, and I know many Europeans, and particularly British, might miss this point, but the reason being, they had guns. This reflects the political society in England was becoming increasingly radical during this period. And one of the most extreme groups were the levelers, who wanted the army to throw out parliament and create a democratic system of governance in which all quote-unquote freeborn men would be able to vote for accountable politicians. During his kidnapping, King Charles secretly made a compact with the Scottish this secret compact is known as the engagement. The engagement meant that the Scottish would invade England and would restore King Charles with his old powers intact. Charles soon escaped and the Scottish invaded and the Royalist rebellions broke out across the country beginning the Second English Civil War. The Second English Civil War was a short one and only lasted less than a year. Within a year, the new model army had crushed the rebels and defeated the Scottish army at the Battle of Preston. Charles decided to return to the negotiation table, but the leadership of the new model army known as the Grandees weren't interested. So, in late 1648, some soldiers commanded by Colonel Thomas Pride stormed Parliament and removed anyone who disagreed with the Grandees, and this is called Pride's Purge. The parliament that was left, known as the Rump Parliament, opted to put Charles on trial for high treason. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. On the 30th of January, 1649, King Charles I was beheaded at Whitehall Palace. With the king dead, shortly afterwards, a republic was declared, called the Commonwealth of England. This republic in England independent of king was governed by the rump parliament and the council of state chaired by Cromwell. Parliament and the council didn't really do much except sell off royal assets and lands in order to fund the army to send it to Ireland. And the Irish rebels, known as Irish Confederates, were being supported by English and Scottish royalists who had rallied behind Charles's son, his name, Charles II. Cromer was tasked with the reconquest of Ireland and with his army of well-equipped veterans made inroads very quickly. He gave the Irish assurances that those who surrendered would not be harmed. But when he took the towns of Drogheda and Wexford, he promptly slaughtered their garrisons and many of the civilians living there. Cromwell returned to England in 1650, but the conquest was largely completed in his absence by 1652. Ireland was completely ransacked during this invasion and it's estimated that about 40% of its total population died between 1641 and 1652. It was then ordered that the rebels were to lose their land, and about 35,000 of the Irish were forced into indentured servitude and shipped off to the New World to work in plantations. Interestingly enough about the American colonies, most of the American colonies backed the Royalist side, but with great support for Cromwell in the North. So upon his return to England, Cromwell had to deal with the Scottish, who had received Prince Charles Jr. and proclaimed him as Charles II of Scotland, beginning the Third English Civil War. And these English Civil Wars were starting to become sort of like spring breaks. Cromwell marched his army north and crushed an even larger force at the Battle of Dunbar. He swiftly occupied Edinburgh, and the next year the two met again at Worcester, and yet again Charles lost and ran away to the continent, and he who runs away to the continent lives another day to fight upon it, or some kind of a saying like that. This is considered the end of the Third English Civil War by 1653. And by 1653, Cromwell was getting a bit sick of the rump parliament, and so dismissed most of its members. Cromwell then created a parliament made up of a select few men who Cromwell considered to be deeply moral. And this is considered either the Parliament of the Saints or the Barebones Parliament, whichever you decide. 
this parliament failed to do anything and so Cromwell had a constitution crafted. This constitution was considered an instrument of government and this instrument declared Cromwell to be the Lord, the Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland, and Ireland. That is to say, we're now part of the same state and Cromwell, with the help of the Scottish general George Monk, could achieve what all the previous kings of England had failed to. Anyway, Cromwell's rule was mired with financial problems and it also saw the Commonwealth dragged into numerous wars. The first was the First Dutch-Anglo War in 1652, which started because of the 1651 Navigation Act, which prevented English colonies in North America from trading with foreign states directly without using Britain as the middleman. The result of this was the Dutch losing, but very little change. And this wouldn't be Cromwell's last foreign war, since in 1654, war broke out with Spain. In the end, the Commonwealth seized Jamaica and the Caribbean, as well as Dunkirk in Europe. Back in England, Cromwell was struggling with his new regime in 1657. After a failed period of direct military rule, a new constitution was passed, and Cromwell was offered the crown, which he declined. And when you understand how kings are treated as figureheads who lack virility, Cromwell's decision makes more and more sense. Resistance to his rule was starting to grow, so he had to resort to much fiercer tactics to get what he wanted. This included taxing without consent of parliament and throwing those who disagreed with him in prison without trial. Of course, he could do nothing about those who disagreed with him outside of England, such as Thomas Hobbes, my man who whilst living in France, wrote his magnum opus, Leviathan. Leviathan was a defensive absolute monarchy like that of France and condemned the concept of republic as well as social contracts. Most of the issues of society can be traced back to listening to Locke and not listening to Hobbes. Anyway, Cromwell's troubles came to an end in 1658 because he died. Then the title of Lord Protector passed to his son, Richard Cromwell, because, again, it was nothing like a monarchy, right? I mean, Lord Protector was totally different than king or monarchy. So I guess you could call Richard sort of like Lord Protector Jr. or Lord Protector in waiting, because definitely not Prince Richard, right? I mean, not of the Republic of England. It's different. Anyway, further along the history of British democracy, in 1659, Richard, Lord Protector Jr., resigned in the rump parliament and returned to run the country. This all went... England lit itself on fire pretty quickly, and it looked like another civil war was brewing, so General Monk marched down south once in London, Monk reinstated all of the members of Parliament who had been ousted in Pride's Purge. And then, in 1660, Parliament, the same one that had been in session since 1642, finally dissolved itself in what is known as the Long Parliament. During this time, Monk had been in contact with Charles II, son of the former, late, assassinated King Charles I who had issued what was called the Declaration of Breda, forgiving everything that had happened since 1649, so long as the people there accepted him as their king. The exception being, of course, for those who had signed his father's death warrant. Kinda reasonable. And you know what? I don't even blame him. A new parliament was summoned, called the Convention Parliament, which acknowledged Charles II, the rightful King of England. And in May of 1660, Charles II returned, ending the Commonwealth and England's Republican experiment. And it was not but a few years later that the fire of 1666 destroyed most of the records of these events. But of course, also began the Restoration Period and the Experiment of Liberty. <laughs> Charles is the most entertaining king, known as the Merry King. In Exodus and Exile from England, Charles II was hanging out 
sitting shiva in the Netherlands, living a life interesting and comfortable. Then in 1660, he was invited to come back from the Netherlands because people of England were becoming tired of the radical military fundamentalist fanatic Protestants who ran things in England like puritanical Al-Qaeda. People were getting sick of it. Radical minorities suck, and the religious militarization fabricated an all-too-similar love child, a match made in hell. So anyway, England decided to invite back this monarch, a rather fun guy, actually, Charles II. I mean, he seems pretty decent. Known for his good temperament and being agreeable, he was actually born to party, it seems. Kind of everyone's friend, and Charles II was, in a lot of ways, almost the anti-Puritan. In a time where everything had to have an equal and opposite reaction, you could say the reaction, the reaction to the intensity and witch hunts of the 1630s was the relaxed, laid-back, and super chill vibe of the long-haired and well-dressed Charles II, Charles 2.0, Charles trying harder, Charles not trying at all, just Charles being himself. And Charles with no expectations whatsoever. Charles all about liberty. Liberty, your liberty, our liberty, liberty, and even libertinism. So, Charles II, good temperament, agreeable, down to party, and had some spaniels. Spaniels are dogs. There's a certain kind of dog that King Charles had. They're like Spaniard Cavaliers. So when you see purebred dogs used by the elite, it's nice to know which kind of dog they have because it represents something. And these dogs represent anti-puritanical, hyper-libertine existentialism to a point of goalless meandering as opposed to the Rottweiler or the Poodle or the Pug. So, here's the tension. Parliament still has its laws, but the king is wielding executive authority. So, the question arises, to what extent is the law and the executive order to be prioritized and which will be enforced? If an executive reprioritizes the enforcement of laws, since the king is an executive power and the parliament is another executive power, you can look at both of them as actors. One is an individual, the other is a mob. But either way, just actors. So if an executive, one of these executives, reprioritize the enforcement of laws and relax the enforcement or encourage the enforcement by the state or the state's legitimized violent actors, what sort of actions are likely to occur both in an individual and a society of them. The executive branch has some leeway on what laws to enforce. Charles II issues a Declaration of Indulgence. The Declaration of Indulgence says that Charles II is not going to issue or enforce any laws specifically enacted to limit church and state, and specifically says he's not going to cause pogroms against Jews and specifically Catholics, and more interestingly, perhaps, nonconformists in general. Charles II, the Merry Monarch, avoids the problems his father and grandfather had because he acquiesces to his people's free practice of religion and more so behavior. Of course, this is not as popular with some. For instance, the Puritanical Protestants find the extreme liberty of sex drugs and polyrhythmic lyre music too intense and footloose for their communities and shires. Meanwhile, Europe is experiencing a Catholic resurgence, it seems, and in France, for instance, Louis XIV had limited toleration of Protestants. The Huguenots had been around, but eventually the Catholic liberal debauchery outplaced it, and Louis decided there was no need for the Huguenots and did away with them. This was perhaps the beginning of the long-term 
revenge story that became the destruction of the French royal family. However, at the time, Europe itself became more and more Catholic, and England, England seemed to move the other direction. The response to this is that Parliament passes the Test Act, and the Act for Preventing Dangers, which may happen from Popish recuses, and related Catholic or Jesuit interference. One of the main provisions of the Test Act was to require that all governmental office holders be obliged to receive communion in the Anglican Church. This religious test, it was thought, might excommunicate some from Jesuit circumstances. However, little did they comprehend the Greco-Sanskrit etymology of Catholicos, meaning universal or metafundamental. In order to understand the Jesuits are capable of eating bread in virtually any of the four corners of the earth. However, the plot was transparent. The government was to be controlled by the Protestants, and Protestant toleration became established. Protestant churches with legal privileges and legal preference. James II produced legal preference for the Catholics, and many ranting paranoids within the Parliament theorized that James II brother of Charles, would abolish the current system, react against them, and produce an opposing legal preference against their Protestant oligarchy, and instead on behalf of the Catholics. Meanwhile, the U.S. Constitution, in fact, responds to this with the line, there will be no religious test that shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. And it's an interesting rebuttal. Synchronistically, modernization of governance by the parliament in the post-republic restoration period worked to mediate some of the issues of having a royal family by designing a parliamentary-controlled royal allowance. Parliament paid a fixed amount each year instead of land taxes, making monarchy dependent on the parliament and reining them in. Meanwhile, in regards to libertinism, Charles II's court was full of libertines, and scandalous characters such as his friend, the Earl of Rochester, friend being a strong word, his total bro crush, clearly the king was obsessed with Wilmot, and Wilmot just negged him, negged him super hard, and Charles loved him for it. And maybe that's why the king kept him around so often, because it's pretty rare to have someone be honest with you. So you might as well at least have one guy. But at one point, John Wilmot said about Charles II, Rest, Restless, he rolls about from whore to whore, a merry monarch, scandalous and poor. And it's a fair claim, because Charles II had a wild time with wild women and at least seven mistresses bastard at least 14 children, all illegitimate. The fundamental issue with royal bastards needing velvet curtains, let alone roofs, which is prohibitively expensive, and Charles never finds a reasonable woman to govern his psyche and home, let alone his state and kingdom. So, this is John Wilmot, Earl of Rochester's point. Not that he means anything particularly emotionally legitimate, if you will. Nothing moral, certainly, if anything. Wilmot considers a wife like a new horse perhaps as fine as a set of croquet mallets, enjoyable and essential to his game, the game rather, whereas the Earl of Rochester was simply the unhateable player. A wife to Wilmot was a provision, an excess, jewelry, something bemusing and inspiring, yet something he could never provide comfort nor sincerity to, certainly not love. Poetry, perhaps, but certainly not love. Rochester was virtually shell-shocked beyond capacity for emotional connection, let alone intimacy, and his familiars of speech, his social inter... His social interlocutors were often left shattered of mind and broken-hearted. In trade, if not philosophy... The Dutch were an issue, and existed at least as a gaming enemy for the British, in the sense that their gains were in opposition to each other's, and each would rather have the other's wealth, and those riches needed to be had by one and not the other. The Dutch and the British competing for trade, so the British and the French shared an interest in shutting down the Dutch. 
the Spanish had long since lost control of the Dutch, and so it seemed inevitable that someone had to tax the Dutch's liberty. Louis the Fourteenth is Louis the Fourteenth, tired of the Huguenots and annoyed that the Spanish had lost control of the issue, saw the trading empire of the Dutch beyond the state as a rogue trading empire. The Dutch East Trading Company were described, in a sense, as a terrorist philosophy of corporatism and piracy, like a neighbor with a fancier new car who works less, a covetable nuisance. Simultaneously, Charles II has to support all of his mistresses and illegitimate children, and Parliament is being stingy with the allowance. King Louis says, I have more money, and I can give Charles a loan. And so they fabricate the secret treaty of Dover, with some secret provisions, for one, that Charles will get the money by joining Louis's war against the Dutch, and so that Charles and Louis will double-team the Dutch, double-double Dutch, Dutch oven, Dutch treat. And then there's the pug dog promise. So Charles II was a lifelong freedom fighter and a fan of liberty, and Louis was a syphilis-ridden sex addict with more whores than shoes, and loved the Catholic Church. Thought the whole Jesuit idea was one fantastic Gore Vidal-esque sexual supernatural esoteric orgy and thought Charles should love it. No big deal, he said, but Louis asked Charles to consider, consider Charles, pretty pretty please, that if the opportune time were to come, Charles, why not convert to Catholicism? But it wasn't set in stone, but he said at some point he might, if the opportunity came, he would become Catholic. But Charles spent his whole life not Catholic, and, you know, it was on his deathbed, of course, that Charles converted to Catholicism. He pulled a priest in and delivered a long confession and was absolved and died Catholic, much to the shock and horror of the Parliament. And with this long-term promise, some could wonder if he was actually a Catholic in secret, and one could wonder. I mean, the, the long-term plan would be held in the hand of his brother James, an obvious Catholic, one that the Parliament had long hoped to hang. Now, this is where Rochester comes back in and why he's so essential, because John Wilmot, the Earl of Rochester, had insulted his friend, the King Charles II, and gone into hiding while parading as a quack gynecologist. Yeah, I mean, this guy was pretty funny. Yet, before dying of syphilis and within his rotting flesh, bothered to limp into the court and present his argument about the hanging of the king for the sake of liberty, English liberty in the face of democracy was looked at by Hobbes as being a feat nearly impossible, where Locke had argued that the debauchery of design in the Vatican and in Paris could be controlled like the economy of the Dutch, through corporate social responsibility, and neither could see eye to eye. Blinded in one eye and limp in a leg, covered himself in urine and blood with dragon's breath of gingivitis, the Earl of Rochester presented himself to his fanatics, his fans, the Lords of Parliament of England. Many of them would consider him beyond a rock star, a superstar, or beyond, something so much beyond. Many would consider this individual an existential experiment in the first order, designed to live and designed to die. Humanity would measure by use of this man, using him as a metric. This lightweight rod of flesh breathed, by, breathed into by God, whom himself exhaled the divine breath defiled in smoke and fire, considered by these lords of the house. For they savored him as their hero, many. And so much as he stood for their opportunity beyond any social obligation, in so many words, to the restoration and to the libertine man, John Wilmot, the second Earl of Rochester, he was their antichrist. It's a pivotal moment in history, and it's worth considering what the moment was like how the moment occurred, which changed the fate of governance forever. By the way, how cool is it that we have court transcripts from centuries, in fact, millennia ago? Court transcripts are so interesting. Perhaps people speak a specific way when they are in a court. However, they usually are on their best terms. So it's interesting and fantastical just to see just to hear these otherwise lost moments captured, recorded,
And despite how far back these moments are, how similar these moments are, perhaps, to some of the moments we are in now, some of the new moments we are forever facing. So anyway, at some point, during the Parliament's vote of the exclusion crisis, out waddles John Wilmot, the Libertine, the Earl of Rochester, and he says, My lord, this bill before us would seek to bar the king's brother from succeeding to the throne on the grounds that he is a Catholic. And for this reason, it has been said that no good Protestant can speak against this bill. And yet, sir, I cannot forbear to offer some objections against it. But the question will arise in the minds of some lords here present as to whether or not I am indeed a good protestant. No man here will question, I hope, my goodness in any of the three chief pursuits of our age. The scribbling of verses, the emptying of bottles, and the filling of wenches. There may be those who claim to be as good as I, but taking these three pursuits simultaneously, and, sir, I have so taken them, and can vouch that considerable manual dexterity is required, I cannot be equaled, let alone bettered. So, let not my goodness be questioned. It is not so many years since our present king's father was killed on a kind of stage outside the walls of this very building. And in time, his murderers were condemned and themselves executed, but were they condemned without being heard? They were not, in spite of the certainty of their guilt and the horrid weight of their cowardly crime. They were allowed the due process of law. What is suggested before this house is that we condemn that murdered king's second son with less shrift than was given to his killers. My lords, let us have justice. When the time arrives for our good and present king to be taken from us, let then his Catholic brother be impeached in this house in the normal way, and if he is found to be wanting, then let his head be chopped off at the neck. If, if the house feels that is what he merits. But, for my part, I shall believe my oath of allegiance to the throne to be a thing inviolable, and that whatever the faith of the successor to the throne, his preeminence in the royal lineage must hold sway over all considerations. Sir, my humble motion is that the monarchy be upheld, and this meddlesome and fractious bill be thrown out forever. My lords, I thank you for your consideration. Exertus.